Good afternoon and welcome to the 16th annual Hesburgh Lecture in Ethics and Public Policy. My name is Scott Appleby and I'm the director of the Joan B. Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. The Kroc Institute established the Hesburgh Lectures in 1995 in honor of the Reverend Theodore M. Hesburgh, CSC. Educated at Notre Dame and the Gregorian University in Rome, Hesburgh was ordained a priest of the Congregation of Holy Cross in Sacred Heart Church, now Basilica, here on campus in 1943. I think if we do the math, that means Father Ted is in his 67th year as a priest. At the age of 35, in June of 1952, he was named the 15th president of Notre Dame and served in that capacity for 35 years until 1987. Father Ted built the modern Notre Dame, overseeing not only the rise to prominence of the university in the ranks of American higher education, but also the transfer of university governance from the founding religious community, the Congregation of Holy Cross, to a predominantly lay board of trustees in 1967 and the admission of women to the undergraduate program in 1972. Father Ted has served four popes, three as permanent Vatican City representative to the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna from 1956 to 1970. At the request of Pope Paul VI, he built in 1972 an ecumenical institute in Tantur, Jerusalem, which Notre Dame continues to operate and which has a brand new rector today. He has held 15 presidential appointments over the years to commissions on civil rights, the peaceful uses of atomic energy, campus unrest, treatment of Vietnam offenders, third world development, and immigration reform, only to name a few. At the same time, he remained a national leader in the field of education, an achievement reflected in his 135 honorary degrees. Is that the right total? Or? I'm sorry? 150. Have you gotten that many in one year, or I'm just way behind? You can't keep up with them, so 150. I think that's the Guinness record by a long shot. The commitment to peace and justice and to exploring the ethical dimensions of public policy characterizes Father Ted's career as a charter member and chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, as a member of President Ford's Clemency Board, as a member of the Board of Overseas Development Council, as chair of the Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy, as leader of a coalition of scientists and world religious leaders in condemning nuclear weapons. He is the recipient of the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor, bestowed on him by President Lyndon Johnson in 1964, and the Congressional Gold Medal bestowed upon him by President Clinton and congressional leaders in July 2000. Three related international institutes are part of Father Ted's legacy at Notre Dame. The Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, the Helen Kellogg Institute for International Studies, and the Center for Civil and Human Rights. The Catholic University should be a place, he wrote, where all the great questions are asked, where an exciting conversation is continually in progress, where the mind constantly grows as the values and powers of intelligence and wisdom are cherished and exercised in full freedom. That spirit of open-ended inquiry that takes values seriously and cherishes wisdom has informed previous Hesburg lectures given by Stanley Hoffman, Jean Bethke Elstein, Richard Falk, Michael Ignatiev, Martha Nussbaum, Saskia Sassen, Anthony Lake, Freeman Dyson, Michael Walzer, Ken Roth, Lee Hamilton, Mary Calder, Shashi Thoreau, Reverend J. Brian Hayer, and last year, Iranian human rights activist and Nobel Peace Laureate, Shireen Ibadi. To this illustrious group, we now welcome Martha Minow, the Dean of Harvard Law School and the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law. After completing her undergraduate studies at the University of Michigan, Minow received a master's degree in education from Harvard and her law degree from Yale. She clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall, the Supreme Court of the United States, and has taught at Harvard Law School since 1981, where her courses have included civil procedure, constitutional law, family law, international criminal justice, jurisprudence, law and education, nonprofit organizations, and the public law workshop. 
an, ex an expert in human rights and, advocate and advocacy for members of racial and religious minorities and for women, children, and persons with disabilities. She also writes and teaches about privatization, military justice, and ethnic and religious conflict. In addition to numerous scholarly articles published in journals of law, history, and philosophy, Professor Menno has authored, edited, or co-edited more than a dozen books, including Just Schools, Pursuing Equality in Societies of Difference, Breaking the Cycles of Hatred, Memory, Law, and Repair, Partners, Not Rivals, Privatization and the Public Good, and Between Vengeance and Forgiveness, Facing History After Genocide and Mass Violence. She is the co-editor of two law school case books, Civil Procedure, Doctrine, Practice, and Context, and Women and the Law. Her latest book, In Brown's Wake, Legacies of America's Educational Landmark, will be published this summer. The recipient of honorary degrees and awards for her teaching and civic service, Dean Menno served on the Independent International Commission, Kosovo, and helped to launch Imagine Coexistence, a program of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, to promote peaceful development in post-conflict societies. Her five-year partnership with the Federal Department of Education and the Center for Applied Special Technology worked to increase access to the curriculum for students with disabilities and resulted in both legislative initiatives and a voluntary national standard opening access to curricular materials for individuals with disabilities. She currently works on the Divided Cities Initiative which is building an alliance of global cities dealing with ethnic, religious, or political divisions. Minow chairs the board of directors for the Revson Foundation in New York and serves on the boards of the Baslin Center for Mental Health Law, the Covenant Foundation, Facing History in Ourselves, and the Iranian Human Rights Documentation Center. A fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 1992, Minow has also been a senior fellow of Harvard Society of Fellows. She co-chaired the law school's curricular reform committee from 2003 to 2006, an effort that led to significant innovation in the first year curriculum, as well as new programs of study for second and third year JD students. Today, we're also honored to have with us Martha's father and mother. Newton N. Minow was member of President John F. Kennedy's administration as chairman of the Federal Communications Commission and as, and as a senior partner in the Chicago law firm of Sidley Austin. The moving force behind the establishment of the Commission on Presidential Debates, he has long been a voice for integrity in broadcasting, a trusted counselor to presidents, and a skilled and highly respected mediator. He has been, among other things, a leader in efforts at peace in the Middle East and, not least, the first Jewish member of the Board of Trustees of this university. Mr. Minow has had more than his, five, more than his 15 minutes of fame, certainly, but he coined the phrase he is most associated with in a speech entitled Television and the Public Interest, delivered on the May the 9th, 1961, to the National Association of Broadcasters in Washington, D.C. I quote, when television is good, nothing, not the theater, not the magazines or newspapers, nothing is better. But when television is bad, nothing is worse. <laughs> I invite each of you to sit down in front of your television set when your station goes on the air and stay there for a day without a book, without a magazine, without a newspaper, without a profit and loss sheet, or a rating book to distract you. Keep your eyes glued to that set until the station signs off. I can assure you, I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. <laughs> you will see a procession of game shows, formula comedies about totally unbelievable families, Blood and thunder, mayhem, violence, sadism, murder, western bad men, western good men, private eyes, gangsters, more violence and cartoons, and endless commercials, many screaming, cajoling, and offending, and most of all, boredom. <laughs> True, you'll see a few things you'll enjoy, but they'll be very, very few, and if you think I exaggerate, I only ask you to try it. Close quote. We're so grateful that they took your words to heart, sir, <laughs> and cleaned up their act. Martha's mother is also here, Joe Minow, who's been a leading contributor to civic life in Chicago, serving on the board of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the Chicago Historical Museum. Although they're not here, sister Nell Minow is a nationally acclaimed movie critic and commentator on corporate ethics, and Mary Minow, a recognized expert in library law. Martha, thank you for keeping up the family reputation. We're delighted you're, you're all here with us today. 
I am delighted then to present Martha Minow, who will speak to us today on the topic of education as a tool in preventing violent conflict, suggestions for the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Please join me in welcoming Dean Minow. I'm tempted to say I wish my parents were here, but they are. <laughs> what an honor it is to be here, and especially at the Kroc Institute under the auspices of the Hesburgh Lecture. There is no one I admire more than Father Ted. His leadership in education, civil rights, and peace is associated with the very best moments of American history for as long as I can remember. He even appears on the screen of one of my favorite movies, Rudy. <laughs> Father Ted is also a beloved person in my entire family, and not just because he involved my dad as the first Jewish trustee of Notre Dame. So I'm especially honored uh, that Father Ted is here, as are my parents. A few years ago, Father Ted challenged me to consider what precisely could wise and committed people do to advance peace in the Middle East. And he suggested Notre Dame's Ecumenical Institute at Tartar as a site. He said so clearly that I remember it now. A few people could offer a space where people could come together and make a difference. I hope today to be responsive to that charge, to take responsibility and to imagine how even a few people can make a real difference in preventing horrific violence and human destruction. When political leaders, scholars, and activists list potential steps for preventing genocide and mass atrocity, the options range from increasing monitoring and early warning systems strengthening global diplomacy and military forces for humanitarian intervention, strengthening the rule of law, prosecuting and punishing individuals most responsible for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, and usually somewhere at the end of the list, education. Education may seem the softest item on the list, but I think it could be the most important element. Realistically, in democracies, diplomatic and military action will not be taken without the support and pressure of voters who can learn and can be mobilized through education about the costs of mass atrocity and the potential to prevent them. Education, more fundamentally, can equip people to see warning signs and to resist recruitment to participate in or stand by as mass atrocities occur. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Luis Marino Ocampo, has identified prevention as core to his mission. And I invite you to join with me in developing suggestions for how he can foster education as a prevention tool. Can we bring some hard-headed thinking to this possibility? This means considering the special situation of a brand new institution, the International Criminal Court, created by treaty that includes prevention as well as enforcement in its goals. The court addresses the crimes of pr genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Education and human rights and conflict resolution, in fact, motivates many institutions, nonprofit and non-governmental organizations. It certainly falls within the ambit of nation states themselves, and it's not mentioned anywhere explicitly in the Rome uh, statute that authorizes the ICC. But the International Criminal Court does offer an opportunity to work through its collection of now 110 member states to jumpstart and elevate education for coexistence and peace, or at least that's what I will argue. Let me begin, though, by talking about the problem that needs prevention. War, atrocity, genocide, torture, rape. These may seem to be the names of the problems, but in fact, they are manifestations of deeper underlying problems. <laughs> The underlying problems, I believe, are the easy availability of denigrating conceptions of other people as an outlet for fear and insecurity, and a resource for unscrupulous leaders to manipulate. Another underlying problem is the lack of tools and knowledge to resist conflict and this kind of manipulation. Two stories haunt me. I've told them before, but I must repeat them here. The first I heard from Dr. James Orbinski, who was the, then the president of Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, when he served as head of that group's mission in Rwanda, just when the genocide unfolded. When he learned that a particular hospital was sheltering several hundred children, but was under the control of the Hutus, 
He went to the leader in charge, a Hutu, and he asked that man to take the children to a safer place. The leader said no. Dr. Urbinski said, do you have children? And the man said, why, yes, and he pulled out photos from his wallet. The, phys the physician, though, returned to the situation at hand and said, Dr. Urbinski said, but these are children too. And the Hutu leader said, no, they are cockroaches. The next day, half of the children had been murdered. A documentary film entitled Promises tells the second story. The film follows the separate lives of seven children who live in and near Jerusalem. Some are Israeli Jews, some are Israeli Arabs. There is a Jewish boy who lives in one of the settlements, a religious Arab, two secular Jewish Israelis who are twins, one grandchild of refugees who still lives in the refugee camps, and one child of a Palestinian who's imprisoned by the Israelis as a security risk. Some of the children become curious about the others who are being filmed, and the filmmaker arranges for the twin Israelis, Yarko and Daniel, to meet several Palestinians in the refugee camp, which is only 20 minutes outside of Jerusalem, but obviously worlds apart. The film follows the meeting of these children. In their early teens, they overcome initial awkwardness, they share a meal, they play soccer, they wrestle. They discuss how they feel, now having met one another. Daniel, one of the Israelis, said he never understood how anybody could support Hamas, the militant Palestinian organization. But based on this one day, he says, I understand. He concludes that he, too, would support Hamas if he were in the situation of his new friends. Faraj, one of the Palestinian adolescent boys, starts to cry. He says he fears that the glimmerings of mutual understanding will disappear when the filmmaker leaves. The film ends with a follow-up visit two years later with the same individuals. By that time, the older teens, Daniel the Israeli, notes that the connections has uh, faded, although Faraj, the Palestinian, tries to keep in contact. For himself, Daniel observes that he has other things to think about, like life and school and soccer. Faraj looks hardened, hollow-eyed, resigned to the long political struggle that could extend through the lifetime of his future grandchildren. What can prevent people from thinking about other people and other people's children as cockroaches, as worthy of extermination? What practical and psychological shifts are necessary for people to undertake the long-term work of overcoming prejudices and politicized differences? What, if any, opportunities for learning can help people seek the humanity of individuals despite persistent conflicts organized around group identities and political struggles. A common impulse after intergroup conflict, whether international, interethnic, or interracial, is to call for education. Education offers the chance to shape hearts and minds and behaviors of succeeding generations. Education responses express this hope. If we can educate, educate young people to respect others, to understand the cost of group hatred, to avoid stereotypes, to develop tools for resolving disputes, to choose to stand up to demagogues, to be peacemakers, we might hope to prevent future violence. After mass violence, the challenge is not to return to normal, because normal is what produced the conflict. Educational change must be part of the more comprehensive efforts to alter the conditions in which intergroup conflict arises. Working with young people in conflict is particularly crucial. Obviously so, because the future lies in their hands, but more subtly so, because studies of memory show that experiences formed in adolescence and early childhood become the basis for the most enduring and vivid memories in a person's lifetime. And the shape of memory is affected by the stories that individuals learn in the context of their own present. Thus, adolescents who live through group conflict will most likely hold on to memories forged during that time for the rest of their lives, and the meanings they attribute to those memories will probably organize their political viewpoint forever. To prevent revenge as a response to the past and to prevent dehumanizing people in other groups, educational experiences for adolescents are vital. Moreover, studies of human development indicate that it is during adolescence that people first develop strong attachment to ideals. The ideals that young people form about their national struggles will connect with their emerging notions of right and wrong, truth and fairness, identity and injustice. For youth inside and outside of conflict region, regions, varied strategies may help prevent mass violence and atrocity. More on that later, but now to the International Criminal Court. This court tackles prevention of atrocities, as does other international criminal law responses, 
through prosecutions, through trials, through judgments, through punishment. They're exemplified by the Nuremberg trials after World War II, followed up by the ad hoc international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Their international criminal justice is, in fact, a burgeoning field. It pursues prevention on four premises. The first is a belief in deterrence. By providing accountability and ending impunity for violations, prosecutions and trials, the claim is, will prevent future offenses. Kofi Annan explained, we have little hope of preventing genocide or reassuring those who live in fear of its recurrence if people who have committed the most heinous of crimes are left at large and not held to account. It is therefore vital that we build and maintain robust judicial systems so that over time people will see there is no impunity for such crimes. The second premise is incapacitation. If alleged perpetrators in ongoing conflicts can in fact be arrested and halted in their wake, then there is indeed a halt of the conflict itself. For this very reason, Prosecutor Luis Moreno Ocampo has argued that enforcing the ICC's arrest warrants against one-time uh, in, in, Interior and Refugee Minister of Sudan, Ahmad Haroun, would itself be an act of justice, simply arresting him. I'd like to point out, no country has come forward to help arrest him. The third premise of international criminal justice is plea bargaining, and this is the most controversial one. It's one that Americans like, but Americans aren't even members of this court. The idea here is that the operation of international criminal institutions can induce perpetrators who currently are engaged in mass atrocities to bargain for their freedom in exchange for some kind of amnesty. And the fourth premise is norm development. By articulating and elaborating norms at international and national levels, the international criminal processes can engage leaders and civil society across the globe in the development of beliefs and priorities which can be used in turn to pressure governments to take appropriate actions to prevent future offenses. Thus far, each of these ambitions is meant to be served through the familiar techniques of criminal law, indictment, arrest, prosecution, trials, conviction, punishment, along with, as I say, the more controversial option of plea bargaining or negotiation in the shadow of the courthouse that is familiar in the United States but rejected in many other parts of the world. What's notable about the International Criminal Court, on top of all of these other institutions, is that this is the first permanent court. If this is the first permanent institution in this domain, it uses hard power as well as soft power. It uses punishment as well as diplo diplomacy and persuasion. Prosecutor Ocampo has emphasized prevention as equal to punishment and investigation. This past January, I had the superb opportunity to teach every day alongside him in a course we held at uh, Harvard and to continue what has been for us a multi-year conversation about what prevention means. He has inspired me to sketch here two special features of the ICC that can lift up education, devising and supporting direct instruction as a potentially new and distinct activity of the ICC. So there are two features of the ICC that make me feel bold enough to make this claim. The first is the membership structure. In this respect, the ICC differs from all other international criminal justice ventures. The Nuremberg trials emerged from a charter of the International Military Tribunal that was simply announced by, by Frank, Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. They were victors after World War II, and they simply announced it. The ad hoc tribunals of the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda are creatures of the UN Security Council, which, yes, indirectly represents member states, but we know that's not how the Security Council operates. And uh, in some sense, the uh, Sierra Leone Special Court is also uh, not a representative uh, body. It is a creature that's both produced by the UN and by the Sierra Leonean government. Consider the contrast the ICC resulted from a treaty negotiation that went on for many years. The Rome Statute, as it is called, became effective at the moment when 60 nations ratified it, and at that moment, the international court itself was created. Currently, 110 nations are members of this treaty, and the treaty, in its own terms, creates an assembly of state parties. It's right there in black and white. The assembly of state parties 
is committed to meeting at least once a year, and it is imagined as an ongoing community of interest that is dedicated, as stated in the preamble of the treaty, to be, and I quote, conscious that all people are united by common bonds, mindful that during the century millions of children, women, and men have been victims of unimaginable atrocities that deeply shock the conscience of humanity, recognizing that such grave crimes threaten the peace, security, and well-being of the world, and affirming that the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole must not go unpunished and that their effective prosecution must be assured by taking measures at a national level and by enhancing international cooperation. So here it is. There's a meeting. It happens every year. Let's do something at it. The Assembly of State Parties offers the resource of an already secured political commitment of 110 nations to affirm the common humanity and address mass atrocity. Its annual meeting offers a resource and a setting for collective discussion and action. Why couldn't this Assembly of State Parties share information and practices about education in preventing mass violence and building peace? The state parties could become a clearinghouse for best educational efforts toward this end, or a client for commissioning research from places like Notre Dame, or a team of rivals competing to enact and evaluate educational programs that prevent grave crimes against humanity. The second notable feature of the ICC has an intriguing name. The name is complementarity. It's not in the dictionary. The Rome Statute authorizing the court is predicated on the view that the court itself and I quote, shall be complementary to national criminal jurisdictions. Rod Rostam of the Office of the Prosecutor of the Court explained a couple years ago, this concept of complementarity aims to bring national and international efforts into a framework characterized by interaction, cross-fertilization, and cooperation. Fundamentally, this concept means that the court itself should defer to and refrain from interfering with effectively functioning national systems. Therefore, the nation states retain the authority to proceed with their own domestic actions. The prosecutor must defer to a genuine prosecution that's proceeding underway at a domestic level. The court itself is instructed to view a case as inadmissible before the International Criminal Court where, and I quote, the case is being investigated or prosecuted by a state which has jurisdiction over it unless the state is unwilling or unable genuinely to carry out the investigation or, or prosecution. Even if the nation decides after investigation not to prosecute such a case, the case remains inadmissible unless uh, there is uh, evidence that the domestic decision not to go forward came out because of political uh, reasons or lack of capacity to proceed. This complementarity idea is genuinely new. In the pursuit of international justice and peace, we've never seen anything like this before. Rather than a conception of international justice as operating somehow outside or above each nation, complementarity advances a presumption that the preferred route for condemning and punishing mass atrocities is within the affected nation states, which itself is presumed to be capable and committed. Where the nation state itself cannot or will not proceed with a prosecution, the international court can, and this approach emphasizes that the locus of responsibility for action remains within each nation, while summoning up collaboration across nations to act where individual nations cannot or refuse to do so. It also creates an incentive for the development of political will and capacity to redress genocide and crimes against humanity inside of each nation. Pro Prosecutor Ocampo has suggested that one measure of success for the court in the future will be that it is no longer needed because its work will be fully taken up by the member states. It's an ambitious vision. This idea of putting itself out of business may never, in fact, happen. But it does motivate the actions of the ICC and the actions of those who are associated with it. Indeed, the prosecutor himself has developed what he now calls a positive approach to complementarity. That means that the office works to promote genuine national proceedings within the limits of the Rome Statute and also pursue national and international cooperation. Picking up on this idea, Professor William Burke White has urged a policy of what he calls proactive complementarity, through which the ICC would actually assist domestic prosecutions. And this would then require, obviously, some careful political analysis and coordination, especially if the ICC is ever to be considered available uh, to proceed if the domestic prosecution has failed. But it's an interesting idea, this complementarity <coughs> idea. And I want to suggest it also offers a resource for my proposal for education. 
because it implies a broader conception of international collaboration. This conception, along with the resource of the Assembly of Member States, emboldens me to propose that the ICC itself adopt education as a priority, education to prevent mass atrocity. And as I've said, the promotion efforts could take the form of designing a model course and disseminating it, or perhaps in keeping with complementarity itself, collaborating with member states to share information about preventive educational efforts, to implement them, to assess them. The boldness of the initiative should be in keeping with the boldness of the court itself and in harmony with its structure and the terms of its statute. And I have on good authority that the office of the prosecutor is willing to do something of this nature, but only if there's something worthwhile to do. And so that's why I will now turn to consider what educational efforts might be worthwhile. I've surveyed educational initiatives relevant to preventing mass violence, and I'll describe here three, five different types. Each grows from a particular assessment of what's needed to promote coexistence and prevent violence. Each also mirrors real political struggles, and each reflects efforts to break cycles of hatred and prejudice. The five types focus on, first, conflict re resolution, second, social contact, third, human rights, the fourth is moral reasoning, and the fifth is education in the history of intergroup conflicts. I think the ICC could do a genuine service by spurring research and initiatives to implement and assess any of these kinds of programs or all of them. Let me first talk about conflict resolution programs. Many of you know about these. Many of you have uh, taken courses of this nature. Many of you have taught them. The idea here is that by teaching young people skills of interpersonal negotiation and mediation and also studies of international peacebuilding efforts, conflict resolution is a field that can make a difference in people's lives. Some schools offer formal programs. Some offer peer training to strengthen students' skills in resolving or transcending conflicts. And some offer programs that are more uh, historical or theoretical. Experts believe that teaching students how to negotiate and communicate and how to mediate their own conflicts can enhance their capacities to cooperate and to employ self-control and reduce incidents of aggression at school. In the United States, about 20% of public schools offer some form of conflict resolution instruction. And there is some pretty good evidence that studies show sustained programs that have at least 25 lessons leave an effect on students. But there's also pretty good evidence that brief programs do not have any lasting effect. One program called Conflict and Communication received support from George Soros' Open Society Institute, and it's been implemented across Eastern Europe, in Macedonia, Romania, and other countries. It uses a basic five-step conflict resolution strategy, and there is some emerging evidence that it has an effect, at least in the immediate lives of the students involved. But there are obstacles to these kinds of conflict resolution uh, and conflict uh, uh, mediation programs if they don't address the larger political context in which the students operate. So one study of conflict resolution and peace building uh, efforts uh, in the Middle East, a study done by Mohammed Abu Nimr, shows that when peace education came into Palestinian schools, it meant an emphasis on national liberation struggle without pursuing any universal approaches for peace and reconciliation. And similarly, po politicized tilt can affect Israeli educational materials, exacerbating the conflict rather than helping to uh, uh, give people tools for moving beyond it. A second kind of educational program is intergroup contact. We're very familiar with that in this country with the uh, mixed results of the legally mandated programs for racial desegregation <laughs> and voluntary school desegregation efforts. There are also, across the globe, intensive short-term experiential learning programs that bring together people from different sides of conflicts, Palestinians and Israelis, people from opposing sides in Northern Ireland, and in the United States, there are programs that cross the racial and class divide. Some of these intensive programs are effective, some are not. What's interesting to me is how controversial the idea of intergroup co contact as an educational initiative remains in this country and in others. Last year, when I was participating in a fascinating meeting in Boston, drawing together teams representing divided cities, 
cities, including Mitrovica, in which half of its residents think is in Kosovo and the other half think is in Serbia, Kirkuk, Iraq, uh, Nicosia, Cyprus, and a town in Northern Ireland, some of you may know, the, number, the members who were at our meeting said they couldn't agree on the name of the town. Therefore, they called it Slash City for the slash in the middle of the name. It's either Derry or London Derry, and they couldn't agree on the name of the town. So we had right in the room people who had, shall we say, rather sharp disagreements. And we took them on tours of sites in Boston that had been locations of the intense conflicts over school desegregation about 30 years ago. And as we were traveling around, I asked one of the government officials from Iraq about the prospects for integrating the schools in Iraq across religious and ethnic differences. And he replied, without any emotion, we would go to war over that. I raised a similar issue to one of the representatives from Nicosia, Cyprus, and he said, as long as we don't have to share soccer teams, it might be possible. <laughs> Post-conflict efforts at intergroup conflict seek to prevent new cycles of conflict, but they do pose challenges. There's the very first school in Bosnia now enroll students who are Muslim Bosniaks and also students who are Catholic Croats. But once the students walk into the school building, everyone's very proud of the school. You know what happens? The school sorts the students into different classrooms by nationality. A journalist who reported on the school said, in keeping with the national government's official stance of separate education, with each student having the right to be taught in his or her own language and to learn his or her own religion and history, the gymnasium, the name for the school, separates the students according to nationality. So that's so much for an integrated school. The students do come together for sports and some extracurricular activities. And there's a science lab that's paid for by a donor who restricts its use to students who come in integrated groups. But it gives you a clue about why intergroup contact is a very difficult strategy to pursue. As for the short-term uh, 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 meetings uh, where people come together for a summer or for two weeks, there's some evidence that can, this can produce some kinds of friendships. Seeds of Peace is a good example of a program that's been well studied. It brings together people from uh, both sides of the Middle East conflict. And yet, there are also pretty good studies that show it's very difficult when the graduates of these programs go back home to even pursue their friendships by the internet, can produce conflicts with their parents uh, when their newfound relationships are not much appreciated or supported. In a very different setting, of course, the Kroc Institute, the Kellogg Institute, the master's programs here um, are abundant evidence of the power of shared study and interaction and building relationships across the globe. Maybe it helps if you're a little bit older than teenagers. A third kind of uh, educational initiative is uh, teaching human rights. And here we actually have many examples. Um, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has a curriculum that is offered around the world, teaching students about the rule of law and social movements. But it's kind of interesting. Uh, their uh, teaching guide called ABC's Teaching Human Rights, Practical Activities for Primary and Secondary Schools, actually itself is quite a challenge to many communities because it calls upon states to ensure that all means of education be used to provide youth with the opportunity to grow up in the spirit of respect for human dignity and equal rights. Quite a challenge in those parts of the world that actually don't offer girl children equal educational opportunities, for example. But in addition, the teaching guide directly and explicitly rejects traditional hierarchical instruction. It calls for teaching methods that are consonant with the content of the human rights that are in the curriculum, the human rights, for example, of freedom of expression and equality. This means exposing the hypocrisy of a lecture on freedom of expression that begins with the instructor directing the students that they have no room to speak. It also means turning to experiential and hands-on learning in many countries that do not use those techniques of learning. I do think that teaching human rights is an interesting approach. It may not be the most uh, important one for the ICC to pursue simply because there are other institutions that are already doing it. But the language of human rights may feel especially meaningful in many parts of the world, not the United States, where the international human rights movement was part of domestic uh, movements to reform their countries. And so I may have a particularly distorted view of this being from the U United States where not only we have we not embraced the International Criminal Court, we haven't endorsed the Convention on the Rights of the Child, unlike every other nation in the world except 
Somalia. The fourth uh, example of kinds of uh, educational programs that could uh, build a basis for peace and uh, prevention of mass conflict is more reasoning and instruction. And here there really are some interesting efforts to try to teach people not only about rights in the abstract, but about reasoning about conflict. At Harvard University, Larry Kohlberg uh, developed a moral education curriculum and ultimately a whole set of schools that were moral schools that were influenced by the cognitive development theories of Jean Piaget. And this theory emphasizes that young people can develop their reasoning capacities as they deal with conflicts and that as they become more and more sophisticated, they can become more and more committed to tolerance and peace building. This work itself has been criticized by people like Carol Gilligan, who finds the work gender biased, um, or Thomas Lacona, who says it's much more important to engage the feelings, the emotions of students uh, and their actions, not just their intellect. But there's work that can combine uh, mind and heart, and people like Howard Gardner and Daniel Grohlman have uh, ex explored curricula that do that. It's so striking that the elements of very effective curricula seem to be very much a description of effective religious instruction, because it seems that having a sense of community, a sense of shared ritual, a sense of common memories are as important as the content of these moral development programs. Poorly conceived and poorly executed programs, of course, would be very unfortunate, um, and so one has to be careful about all of this. Um, I'm interested that the Southern Poverty Law Center develops a curriculum responding to hate at schools that puts a heavy emphasis on the actions of adults in the community. And teachers, counselors, administrators have to take a stand against hate, hateful materials in their community for the educational programs to be thought to be effective. In their massive study of people who did and people who did not seek to rescue Jews in Nazi Europe, Samuel and Pearl Oliner found most strikingly that the rescuers were not individuals of unusual moral courage. Like those who did not try to help, they were ordinary people. Yet the rescuers did differ from those who did not rescue. They were more likely to be members of vital communities. They were more likely to belong to communities that were bound by religious, family, or affective ties. The rescuers were more likely to have grown up in families that emphasized the commonalities of all humankind. They had less exposure to anti-Semitic and other degrading ways of thinking that marked groups as inherently worse than others. The Olner study suggests that moral action may be shaped by the relationships people enjoy and by the messages they receive about their relationships with others. The meaningful education in this sense uh, of moral development requires more than classroom instruction. It calls for membership in groups of common purpose and informal education alongside others with similar goals and reinforcing rituals and cultural practices. The fifth kind of educational initiative is comparative history and self-reflection. And here, I have to confess, I'm on the board of an organization facing history in ourselves, um, which Scott mentioned earlier. 30 years old, this organization uh, is the example, but it's not the only one of the type that I'm not going to describe. The central goal here is to promote young people's capacities for critical thinking, for understanding and tolerance, compassion and caring by looking in depth at history. Teachers in public and private uh, junior and high schools work in particular with facing history to provide students with an intensive look at the failure of democracy in the Weimar Republic, the rise of totalitarianism, the genocide of World War II. Another unit uh, is an in-depth look at the Rwandan genocide, what led up to it and what followed from it. Besides developing rigorous historical understandings, the classes seek to involve students in thinking, in thinking hard about what does it take to prevent a mass atrocity? What kinds of citizen participation are necessary to sustain democratic institutions? What kinds of individual and collective actions are necessary to resist the dehumanization of any individual or group? One teacher reported that it was difficult to find the right words to describe the Teacher Training Institute experience and I quote, in part because so many things took place and on so many different levels. Alternately, casting ourselves in the roles of teacher and student, we acquired information about the history itself. We explored our own feelings, beliefs, and assumptions about genocide, racism, violence, and resistance. And we became our own community while still representing diverse and separate communities back home. This does seem to be an important feature 
of the effectiveness of the program, that it becomes actually a reference group for the teachers themselves, and they go on an, their own journey uh, uh, of exploration and discovery. So I think there is plenty of uh, good reason to believe that educational initiatives are promising enough for an institution like the International Criminal Court to say, we're going to actually take a stand. We're going to promote education. But there's not enough evidence about what really works, and there's certainly not enough evidence about what is uh, effective in different cultural settings. I think that it's striking uh, that as we have the movement of peoples around the world, um, the issues of genocide, the issues of crimes against humanity are in our schools, no matter what country we're in. Uh, in my hometown of Cambridge, Massachusetts, the public school in Cambridge has a program of facing history and ourselves, and what we're discovering that is uh, not what we expected is that it ends up being a direct vehicle for Cambodian refugees, for refugees from Eastern Europe, for refugees from Rwanda to work through the experiences of their own families. One Cambodian refugee wrote, I don't want to hold my anger inside of myself anymore since I've taken this course and become more outspoken about racial hatred and my past. This course has taught me I have something to say for others. The movement of peoples actually in this sense is a resource because I think it's harder and harder for people, even in the United States, to say that's not our problem. Uh, genocide is the problem of our students in our schools because they are refugees from it. So look, I don't want to sound naive, I probably already do. I don't want to make it seem like education is a cure-all because I certainly don't think that. And I see a problem with each of the forms of education that I've identified. Conflict resolution and peace education can equip individuals with useful tools and help them defuse their own conflicts, but without full political and moral frameworks, such programs fail to cultivate students' abilities to know what kinds of conflicts actually are righteous and when to stand up in opposition to mistreatment or abuse of themselves or others. If amplified by historical case studies and moral inquiry, conflict resolution courses could be very effective. Human rights education and moral reasoning instruction, I've already indicated, they risk operating at too abstract a level to engage students' hearts and to make them feel empowered. But these two could be incorporated into programs uh, that go beyond simply abstract ideas. And if they're connected with hands-on conflict resolution activities and application to historical context, these could motivate students and secure lasting lessons. Taken together, all of these strategies, I think, hold enough promise to warrant sustained initiative to treat prevention of mass violence as an important task of uh, efforts around the globe. And I think the ICC is in an unusual position to actually lead the charge. It's permanent. It has 110 member states. It has an annual meeting, as far as I can tell, with nothing to do. It has a doctrine of complementarity, which presses a form of international collaboration that has a respect for individual nation states, a respect that, frankly, is often too often missing in the international human rights movement, a respect that actually uh, puts the presumption that people in each country have the capacity and desire to push for human rights and peace. But it also uh, develops an international network and a network of some real force to help those countries that don't have the political will or the capacity to do what's needed. Given the limited state of knowledge about the effectiveness of different programs and the importance of local context and traditions in determining what kinds of programs are best, perhaps the best thing the ICC could do would be to propel research in the area, to promote initiatives by member states, to challenge member states to undertake national efforts and report back in a year, or how about a five-year plan that starts with presentations and discussions at the annual uh, meeting of the Assembly of State Parties and then pilot programs and then a year of assessment and comparison and then the development of comprehensive plans? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, I was inspired by Father Ted. Uh, if you think it makes sense, tell me. I will follow it up. I have the prosecutor's ear. He's interested. That said, I do acknowledge that there are challenges that could well lie beyond the reach of even superb efforts at the international level. The first challenge is the experience of trauma that students themselves have had. Trauma, if left unacknowledged and untended, shuts down people's capacities to care about others. 
<coughs> trauma can create the context for fantasies of, or even realities of revenge. And education alone cannot address trauma. Other initiatives and resources are necessary to help traumatize young people and their parents, again, something that we're learning in the Cambridge Public Schools. The second challenge comes with pervasive narratives of victimization or entitlement by nations or groups. And this is a problem that's exacerbated when stories of national history and struggles are built right into the textbooks used in schools. When this is going on, it doesn't matter how good and effective the conflict resolution class is down the hall. When the materials grab the imagination and memory of students, people will find it difficult to summon up the generosity and humility to reach for coexistence and to think about the other as anything other than a cockroach. This could well lie beyond the power of anything the ICC could do. And indeed, international law is explicit on this point. International law explicitly restrains any outside nation for directing the educational reforms of a nation state following conflict. This is a law that was enacted after the experience in World War II when allies came in and redid the educational systems in Germany and Japan, and this is now an international principle. At the same time, after World War II, revising history became a huge preoccupation in Germany. After a controversial effort by the Allies, uh, it, it took two years for, after the war ended for new texts to be enacted, and they were written by German scholars, but even then the treatment of the war re be, remained a hugely contentious subject. Uh, and for decades and decades, how German history was taught in the schools was a very sore subject. It apparently mirrored and in turn influenced cycles of grief and denial and acknowledgement over several generations. <coughs> Though in recent years there has been a kind of detente, and there now uh, was a meeting very successful among German historians, and there are new versions of German history being taught in the schools, but this is something that has to be done domestically. It cannot be done internationally. The third grave obstacle is the absence of sufficient conditions on the ground, frankly, to establish sufficient safety, hope, or freedom from discrimination or jeopardy for some or all students to feel like they can even dream about something like peace. For how can young people be expected to take the risks of empathizing with others, to try to become peacemakers, to build friendships in integrated settings, to believe in human rights or moral ideals if their own world cannot assure them safety or supply them with hope? The circularity of the problem of peace is its apparent doom. Because without peace, how can people try to make it? And without mutual respect, how can people try to risk it? Here I have only an aphorism to offer. It's from historian Charles Beard, who described one of the lessons of history this way. He said, when it is dark enough, you can see the stars. I think the ICC is a bright light in the midst of daunting challenges. It represents willing and active efforts of 110 nations to turn the corner on mass atrocity, to reject impunity, to create a permanent court whose very existence is designed to strengthen domestic commitments to condemn and ultimately prevent genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crimes of aggression. I opened with two haunting stories, and I close with what I hope are two bright images. The first is a children's television show. You know from my childhood why I have to talk about television. <laughs> American public television included a great experiment, Sesame Street. And Sesame Street showed that preschool children can learn. They can learn to read and they can learn interpersonal skills by watching television and watching entertainment that's informed by high quality educational research. Inspired in part by this effort, a team of Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian writers and producers have developed a new version of Sesame Street for Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian audiences. It's very popular. The creators did find that the idea of a single street shared by members of different groups was simply implausible. So there is no street in this version. Instead, the show relies on visits between residents of different streets. The show's development has been stymied by violent conflict and diplomatic failures, but it has found support also at the highest levels of diplomacy and government. The second image that I offer I learned about from a teacher in Kenya who leads coexistent efforts across Africa. She told me about a workshop in Rwanda that engaged a group of Hutu and Tutsi women in a dance. It matched one Hutu and one Tutsi 
in pairs throughout the dance. So there were sets of these pairs, and each of the pairs tied their hands together with a thread. And as they moved, as they had to move, they had to practice learning to move harmoniously, keeping this thread tied between them. It's quite an image. The International Criminal Court, I think, holds promise for a new kind of performance. Just as the Hutu and Tutsi women performed gracefully and sat back and marveled at what they did, I look forward to the day when we can marvel how the nations stand up for peace. Thank you. for a terrific, comprehensive uh, analytical speech that we all benefited from. We have some time now for some conversation and questions from the audience. And I'll call them and we'll uh, move along. Who has questions? Katie, please. Thanks so much. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine this recommendation going forward. And a couple of big flags came sure. up for me. One is thinking about the tremendous resilience and creativity that people have within themselves who are going through these atrocities and the fact that most people are not participating in them and most people have great ideas about where they might go, but more often than not they're worried about what the state would do if they move forward. So one alarm goes um, around the concept of anchoring this with something that these member states would somehow try to own and, and implement in their places. And the other one I've seen is in, in a couple of specific places in, in Africa and in the Philippines um, specifically, and in Colombia as well, where people are really trying to, um, trying to maintain an informal network in their <coughs> efforts at peace education, at human rights awareness raising, as a critical mainstay of their effort, that once they formalize, once they institutionalize, they open up to corruption, they open up to stagnation and, and some pretty deep-seated problems. So those are a couple of things that come up, and I'd be really curious great. to hear. Great. So those are great concerns, and uh, I certainly, from my work with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, I've seen both of those things happen. So top-down activities can have both of the effects that you describe. They can kill off or frighten people at the grassroots who are doing important things, or kill off the activities or even the people, but they certainly can kill off the activities. And also they can create great opportunities for corruption because the money comes in and different people who never had any involvement come in with their bus baskets and take the money. And it's, it's a big problem. I mean, just even the, the, the effect on the wage level for translators so the most educated people in the community get hired as translators to help the UN people who come in, float in for a month and then leave and then it's disrupted all the organization. So I, I, I've seen some of what I think you're adverting to. I guess I'm thinking in a, in a little bit more of a long-term way. When I suggest that the ICC might lead uh, an approach, I guess I, I think that the ICC could do two things that have a long-term consequence. One, it could raise international money from donors that would support grassroots organizations that currently don't get any money. And that's why the suggestion that I have of supporting experiments and supporting assessments of them, I think, could be made compatible with the local efforts that you're talking about. And it, these will not be ICC programs. These will be their own private programs, but they'll have sources of funding. Um, and the second long-term idea is that uh, to I, my hope is that this kind of initiative would create an appetite and a pressure on nation states when they develop their national educational standards that it's just expected. You have to have something. We're not going to tell you what it is. You have to have something. Um, that we don't have. You know, there is that kind of pressure on math education. There's that kind of pressure right now on health education, on, on AIDS education. But there's nothing like this on peace building. So that's the long run uh, kind of dimension that I'm thinking about. Thank you. Mariella, please. <coughs> I also want to thank you for very thoughtful uh, remarks and very interesting ones. I'm wondering if um, a place to start with this idea, a place to maybe incubate, is the Harvard Law School. <laughs> that maybe there could be a required course in, I wouldn't say just human rights, but international law. 
in which we do try to uh, present moral reasoning for our students to really think about a common place called the globe where we share one law, where we promote one sense of human rights, and if that wouldn't help both <coughs> as a demonstration project for the other uh, low side that you have in mind, but also perhaps to create a sense and commitment of peace and human rights within this country. So we're a third of the way there. So the curricular reform that I led includes a new required course. Every first year student at the Harvard Law School has to take a course that's international or comparative law. But they have a choice among three courses. And the first is international, public international law, which is very much the sort of course you're describing, um, which you know well. Uh, the second is international economic law, which is our way to say to the business oriented people, you're living in one globe. Uh, you need to understand international institutions. Um, and uh, whatever it is that you think about these things, this is the world you need to know. And the third kind of course is a comparative law course. And we have courses on uh, China, uh, courses on uh, comparative constitution making. And each of these courses, uh, you know, I led the curricular reform. This was my baby. Uh, and I met with the people who were developed the courses, uh, understanding very much the same way with grassroots people in developing courses around the world, my colleagues would not teach well if they didn't have the freedom to do the courses that they want to do. And therefore, we imposed only these basic desiderata. First, the course has to decenter students' perspectives so they don't think the United States is the center of the world. Turns out that's a big deal. <laughs> when I see students and I ask them, how's your, how's your first year international or comparative course going? They say, I'm so confused. I say, great. Then we're doing what we wanted to do. You no longer think you're the center of the world. That's a really good thing. The second thing that these courses have to do is they have to introduce students to uh, international or comparative institutions and sources of law. So that, again, there is no longer a sense that the building blocks of law and justice are just the ones that people in the United States take for granted. And the third element that each of these courses has to uh, convey is that culture matters and that context matters. And you know, it's an experiment. Um, we're only in our third year, but so far, so good. And what we say to students is, you have to take one of these. We recommend that you take all three before you graduate. And so we offer upper level versions of each of the courses. And you know the, the returns are not fully in, but students, it seems to develop their appetite for these kinds of courses. So I, I take your challenge um, very much to heart, and I'll go back home and say, we're only a third of the way there. We have to get further. Please, in the back. So why, uh, what is it in the American psyche that keeps us out of the ICC? You know, it's so interesting. Um, it was literally the last 24 hours of President Clinton's presidency when he signed the treaty. So this is a bipartisan psyche problem, not just one party. He did sign it, but obviously thought it was very controversial. And then, as you know, one of the very first acts that George Bush had in office as president was to invent a new verb, which was unsigned. And he unsigned the treaty. We didn't even know it was possible. Um, and yet, you know, that was a real statement. There wasn't a lot of political support for it. I, I live in a house that was previously owned by, um, I, I guess I'll say it, a Republican. And, um, <laughs> And I, you know, it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me because we get his mail. And so, uh, periodically, you know, I get things in the mail that say, you know, on the outside of the envelope, warning, U.S. may join the Convention on the Rights of the Child and you won't be able to spank your child anymore. It says on the outside of the envelope. I mean, you don't even have to open it up to see how enraged it is. It's my clue that there are people who are enraged about this idea. The phrase American exceptionalism that is touted with great pride, that we are an exception to the rest of the world as opposed to any kind of embarrassment. I don't know, it's a clue. You know, I, I do think that there um, is a danger that internationalism and human rights have been associated with people who are not patriotic, who are not proud of America. And I think that's such a mistake. Americans built the international law world. Americans were there. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, with the Universal Declaration. Uh, uh, it's just it's staggering that we wouldn't understand this. This is our great tradition. In fact, 
really, we should be a little bit cautious of claiming too much credit for it because then some other parts of the world may reject it. But instead, we've run in the other direction and said we don't want to be part of this because it challenges American hegemony and American power. I, you know, I think that we have a new uh, uh, era in this country, a uh, new president who actually have more global perspective, are not afraid of internationalism. I think that there's also just a fact of our interdependence. Um, uh, again, I come back to my experience at Harvard Law School. You know, even in my courses that seem to be entirely domestic, I teach civil procedure, a course about litigation in the American courts. I cannot teach this course without teaching international law because it's constantly presenting to me <coughs> cases where there is jurisdiction uh, questions over non-US parties, cases where, in fact, the Alien Tort Claim Statute uh, is used to bring charges of genocide in American <coughs> courts against people for uh, allegations of genocide. I mean, so I think that um, whatever it is in the American psyche, it's going to hit, if it's not already hitting, the reality test that we live in the world. Uh, and we will be stronger by cooperating with it. I mean, I think uh, President Bush had a, quite an education over the course of his presidency, from a period in which he was against nation building to a period in which he was in the business of nation building, from a period in which he was opposed to any kind of international collaboration to a period in which he was desperate for it. And uh, you know, maybe that's a trajectory for the country itself. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm just intrigued by, by the whole proposal, and I'm just um, afraid that it might actually lead the path that I think has been open of considering the ICC the solution for everything and anything, and at the same time that that will um, dilute a little bit the real impact that the ICC can have. Um, I think, I'm sure that you know even more than I do, all the problems that the outreach program has had to develop. They have no experience, they have no background, they have no even precedence to follow, nothing. Um, so to add something that by nature requires um, a follow-up and a close follow-up, bringing the states to the, to the ASP to give an additional <coughs> speech about education would be completely or I think almost completely useless without a clear follow-up that I don't think the ICC has the capability or the potential to do. And instead of that, I think that there are spread around many other initiatives. I know the ICRC, the International right. Committee of the Red Cross, has developed a great progress, at least in Latin America, with the, Amer the Organization of American States, where the states every year give a report on the progress of implementation and incorporation of IHL in their own curricula. Um, so instead of seeing the ICC as this, the, the place for this, mm -hmm. to probably strengthen the network to build up on all these initiatives where the ICC can bring something. But I just think that that might be a little bit too much for the ICC to buy. It. So it, it's a it, very powerful comment, and it, and it may well be that the very best thing that my talk will do will be to provoke people from other parts of the world, other institutions, to say, the ICC shouldn't do it because we're doing it. That would be fantastic. Uh, you know, the inter-American states are far ahead of other parts of the world. There's nothing like that going on in Africa. There's nothing like that going on in South Asia. It would be amazing, in fact, if, you know, the ICC could hold a meeting and say, oh, we don't need to do it because, look, they're doing it in Latin America. Um, at the moment, though, I guess, the outreach program is not anything to commend. Um, I think it's a misplaced use of their efforts. They don't have any capacity. Um, partly because it's on the mistaken view that it's like, it's equivalent to the ICTR, ICTY, or Sierra Leone. These are special courts that want to communicate to particular audiences. We are doing something to advance justice for you. The ICC is so remote from everybody. Uh, outreach is the wrong idea. Um, I think that, however, uh, the Assembly of Member States is a meeting. It's a group of, of nations that have said, we care about these principles. Let's give them a job they could do. They could raise money to fund education efforts. They could raise money to challenge researchers to assess the education efforts. And you know, maybe if the response is they're not good at it or other people are doing it, that would be great. Let's have someone else do it. I'm intrigued by the fact that there is a prosecutor who sees the time of his appointment running out 
He has two and a half more years. And he frankly knows that the ICC is not doing very much, right? Two trials, two and a half, a bunch of arrests that haven't happened. You know, the uh, moment that he was most happy when we were meeting in January was when I gave him the phrase, shadow of the law. And I said, perhaps the most important work that you do is to create a shadow so that the court, whatever it does, even if it's very little, it will create a shadow in which, uh, in, in the shadow of the court, other things will happen. He suddenly felt, oh my gosh, I have a purpose in life. And it won't be so <laughs> terrible if I leave and we will have done three trials and two of them will have been overturned by the, appeal, by the appeals chamber, which is a real risk. It is a real risk. Enormous amount of money, enormous amount of resources. What Ocampo uh, has is, from his experience in Argentina, not only the guts to go and <coughs> prosecute the very dangerous people, but an understanding of public education as an absolutely indispensable feature of justice. So what did he do after he was prosecutor of the generals in Argentina? And he actually had a TV show. He had a TV show. I didn't tell you that, Dad. He had a TV show, and it was really about you know, how, to, how to do mass education about issues in the world. And so to have someone like that in that role is to have someone who understands the, the, the work of the trial, of the court is important, but the education may be more important. So it seems to me it's an opportunity to at least you know, fuel him. He'll leave. Maybe he'll do something else. Maybe after he's prosecutor, he'll, he'll start an international education initiative. And maybe he'll support regional ones. Um, but it seems like an opportunity to actually seize his ear and seize the public attention that he gets. But I, I'm mindful of the cautions that you say. Yeah. Dean Minow, you'll be happy to know, perhaps, I was at a meeting with uh, Moreno Campo in Washington, the Council on Foreign Relations, in February, which I gather was the month after you gave him the phrase. And he built his entire speech around the phrase, shadow of the law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he sent me the talk. Yeah, he liked he's it. looking for a legacy. Um, I'm a bit concerned with suggesting that an educational mission be entrusted to governments. Um, over the years in my human rights work, I have found that governments are delighted as soon as you suggest that the primary thrust of the human rights campaign should be around education because then they don't have to worry about pesky things like complaints and litigation and, and uh, inspection missions and anything else that sure. might directly affect them. I'm all for education. In the hands of the Harvard Law School, it's a good thing, and I hope it's a good thing here at Notre Dame too, but I wouldn't want to trust the governments of the world, or even 110 of them when they meet in the ASP, with undertaking the mission. So I guess I'm <laughs> somewhat in agreement with Jimena, great function, uh, wrong wrong executors. Mm -hmm. It could well be right, and you know, it was really what I was hoping to have as a conversation, but I'll just push a little bit further. Marrying the education function with the permanent court challenges the idea that it is a substitute. That's the idea that I'm trying to advance. That this is the one institution that actually uses hard power. It's not soft power. This can lock people up, right? If there's education also as part of its mission, that seems to me to belie the suggestion, oh, we don't have to issue compliance reports. Oh, we don't have to do anything else. Because no, actually, you know, you could be arrested if we could only get someone to help arrest people. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that's the premise. That's the premise that I'm trying to pursue. You know, if the response is there are lots of other places that do this much better, that's terrific. I don't think that's true in many parts of the world. And it would be shocking for people around the world to, be, to hear that governments have no role in education. In fact, you know, the government is the primary educator, uh, at least the, the provider of educational resources in most parts of the world. It is. The, the tradition of private education, which we take for granted in this country, is anomalous. The tradition around the world is government support for private education. But it's government funding. You know, we in this country are so allergic to the idea of private, uh, public dollars going to a parochial school. That's how it's done in most parts of the world. But it's done under the auspices of a government curriculum that specifies what has to be done. Governments are in the education business. Whether we like it or not, you may not like it. I think that if it's trying to connect up with human rights and then there's an, uh, uh, a pressure to connect up with the people who actually who are experts in human rights rather than the people who have been running schools in the past, that actually go back to the first question, might create 
a dialogue between these formal institutions and the informal practices that right now doesn't always happen. Now, you know, maybe that's the last kind of dialogue that some people want to have. They don't want to be in touch at all with these government institutions. But the condition of being a child in much of the world is the condition of going to school whether you want to or not. And indeed, in many parts of the world, that's what kids aspire to, in parts of India, parts of Pakistan, to be able to go to school, to be able to, not, to have that as a reason not to be working. You know, the international organizations that work with employers in Pakistan and in India to make sure that kids can go to school for three hours a day. Those are government schools. And then the kid who can't go because there isn't enough money to pay for the uniform or there isn't enough money to pay for the school book. Where's the money going to come from? It's going to come from governments or governments that are seeking uh, donor funds from outside the, go the, the government. That, that's the picture that I have in mind when I'm pushing this. It's understanding that education is the one ticket out for kids around the world. Sandra. Hi, I'm, I'm coming to this uh, from a, a different perspective. I'm a literature professor. And uh, in your survey of the different kinds of um, pedagogical programs that might offer the kinds of things you're looking for, I heard references to history and, and um, to uh, philosophy to, and, yeah. and philosophy. I didn't hear much reference to literature, and okay. I'm thinking of uh, Lynn Hunt's invention of human rights book, mm -hmm. where she gives a very prominent place to the rise of the novel, for example, mm -hmm. as fostering ideas of sympathy and identification and understanding someone else's perspective uh, coming out of uh, the reading of fiction. Uh, is there a place for literature in these programs that you're describing? So this is a subject dear to my heart, and I, and I don't mean to be constantly saying uh, things about Facing History, but I love this program. And Facing History in Ourselves uses fiction all the time, uses works of fiction, uses um, short stories, uses film, and also invites students to write their own short stories and write their own reflections. And uh, the, the moral act of taking the perspective of the other is really at the heart of that curriculum and also some versions of the Kohlberg curriculum that I also mentioned. I think it's better done through fiction than it is through abstraction. That is, so that's my own, uh, my own bias and you and I may have that in common. I think that if you start uh, at a proposal like this that already is getting such a welcome reception here, um, by sa saying now let's teach fiction, it may not be the leading edge of persuasion, but it, when you get down to brass tacks, how do you teach? I think that's how you teach. I teach with, you teach with narratives. You teach with stories. So uh, I'm, I'm in sympathy with what you're saying. Let me get the last question to Bob. Uh, yes, well, it's partly addressed here. But I, mean, I appreciate, first of all, very much your suggestion of using education to round out what the hard law itself may not do, and especially in these difficult contexts. My question is also prompted a little bit by, by Doug's uh, question. I'm wondering. Uh, if you could say a bit more about what you really think the content of human rights education ought to be, particularly, I mean, the bottom line really is how do we encourage a sense of human solidarity, I mean, respect, tolerance, but more than that, hospitality and human solidarity. In your look at human rights education mm -hmm. and your experience with it, what is it that, that helps people turn that corner? Because a lot of people aren't interested in identifying with those groups that they now identify as their as hostile groups. Well, you're totally right. I mean, and, and this is why I do think that the most uh, urgent need is is research, experimentation, and research. I do think that there are pieces of the puzzle to build on already. So, conflict resolution education does have the uh, advantage of meeting students where they are kids around the world have conflicts with other kids and they already can see the value of learning some tools of conflict resolution. When these skills are coupled with something that's a little bit bigger about, you know, you can now draw from your own schoolyard battle to understand what it is that is the political conflict in your country or elsewhere, then it can have some real power. Most of the conflict resolution programs that I've seen don't do that. But if it were connected, therefore, with some of the historical or moral development programs, I think there's some real promise. 
The moral development programs, as I've said, uh, the studies show that those that are purely cognitive have only limited staying power. But those that are connected with uh, <coughs> emotional experiences, those that are connected with hands-on uh, simulations, simulations tend to be very <coughs> memorable. It's fascinating to me how quickly young people, indeed most people, enter into roles and start to behave as if they're in the role. And then if you have sensitive debriefing, it can be very, very powerful. Um, I think that there's another element to, to be gained from the, uh, the work in, in historical uh, reflection. I think that uh, it just turns out that if you take an example that's not the one that people are living <coughs> through, but it's not so far away, that it gives young people an analogy in which to talk about things that may be too hard to talk about. And actually, I had this experience teaching literature to teachers in Northern Ireland. And what I found was I, I, I decided I wasn't going to teach about peace. I wasn't going to teach about those things. I gave them a short story about child abuse. And it was the singularly most insightful discussion I've ever had about that short story. And I've taught it to many, many groups. It's a Mary Gordon short story. It's very, very good. And you know, in the middle of it, I'm saying to these people, and they're from different sides of the conflict there, how come you're so acutely aware of this? And they said, this is about us, not the child abuse, but the larger <coughs> dynamics of conflict. Um, and that's something that I've seen in teaching judges and prosecutors. In fact, teaching fiction is often the best way to do it, but, or taking history that's not their own history, something that's a couple of degrees away but that it gives a common text for people in the room who otherwise don't have much in common to then explore and to bring their own experiences and insights together. And then on that basis of that common experience, they can do something else. So I think we have pieces of the puzzle. I think we need to learn a lot more. Uh, learn what works best with groups that are of different ages. Learn what works best with groups that are heterogeneous as opposed to homogeneous. Or learn what works best, not just in a short-term way, but in a long-term way. So, you know, if there is a, a l larger message of what I'm raising, it's that, you know, we actually have something to build on here, but we need a serious <coughs> academic priority to be given to this field, uh, this field of peace building and uh, uh, conflict prevention education for young people. Because otherwise, it's just going to be another one of those taglines at the end of every speech. Let's have, yeah, let's have education. Um, which, you know, I, I think that's, um, that's failing to understand that this could be the most powerful tool if only we actually brought the same kind of talent and rigor to it that we bring to prosecutions or that we bring to assessments of uh, humanitarian intervention. Please join me in thanking you.